PA Books is a production of PCN, a nonprofit television network. Listeners like you make our programming possible. To learn more about PCN's mission and to support PCN with a donation, visit PCNTV.com. This link and others can be found in our show notes. We appreciate your support. Welcome to the PA Books Podcast. I'm Phil Beckman. PA Books features interviews with authors of books about Pennsylvania history, culture, and people. In this episode, we talk with Elliot Drago about his book, Street Diplomacy, The Politics of Slavery and Freedom in Philadelphia, 1820 to 1850. This week on PA Books, Elliot Drago, author of Street Diplomacy. Elliot Drago is the author of Street Diplomacy, The Politics of Slavery and Freedom in Philadelphia, 1820 to 1850. What is street diplomacy? That's a good question. So uh, street diplomacy really stems from two sort of intertwined concepts. The first, obviously, is studying slavery, kidnappings, and the crisis over fugitive slaves at the street level, so the local level, where diplomacy is actually a term uh, that I borrow from a book called Border War by Stanley Harold, in which he looks at interstate diplomats who were slaveholders who came to northern states to pressure northern state legislatures into revising laws relating to protecting that state's um, black citizens. So uh, the diplomacy angle uh, sort of connects like this more abstract uh, understanding of a connection between the local the state and the national uh, politics of slavery. Now you say in the book that street diplomacy functioned on multiple levels by collapsing space. What do you mean by collapsing space? Well, so this is, um, that's another good question. So what I see happening uh, in the 19th century, particularly in places like Philadelphia, is the fact that black Americans, black Philadelphians in particular, lived in a nation that, uh, in which slavery was legal. Uh, it, they lived in a state that bordered three slave states. Um, and they had this constant crisis uh, in their own communities uh, faced by um, or facing down kidnappers, slave catchers, slaveholders coming to Philadelphia. So by collapsing space, I'm saying, in essence, that the black Philadelphian experience um, in many ways was akin to the experience of the enslaved in the South uh, with a couple of you know, different variables at play, but largely um, the borders between the North and the South seem more illusory and more precarious than I think we often think about. We think about the time. So is this why you, you say that even though Pennsylvania was usually categorized as a free state, uh, you talk about it that in many ways it was akin to a slave state because of these kidnappers and slave catchers operating on the streets? Right. So um, not only do you have what uh, one eyewitness in, from the early 19th century called a, quote, steady traffic of black Americans coming to the city, uh, many of these black Americans had been freed during the Revolutionary Era. Uh, many were self-emancipated, right? Um, but at the same time, what you also see happening is uh, Maryland and Virginia slave owners in particular come to the city searching for those who they either freed, right, which would make them kidnappers, um, or people that had emancipated themselves. And um, of course, kidnappers being criminals, they don't obey by the, they don't abide by the law. So they're going to break the law and do their best to um, inject plausible deniability into any sort of um, seizure of a black American in Philadelphia. Let's talk more about that distinction that you just mentioned between slave catchers who are operating according to the law and kidnappers who were not. Where was the legal distinction there? Well, the legal distinction really depended a lot on the amount of resources that black Americans could call at the moment of their seizure. Um, sometimes, you know, professional slave catchers, I spotlight one particular slave catcher, George F. Alberti Jr., who operated for 40 years in Philadelphia, and he would use legal and illegal means. Uh, the legal means that he would use would simply be um, contacting slaveholders in the southern states saying that we think that the person who ran away from you is up here in Philadelphia, so, I, you know, give me some money and I will track them down. Um, the kidnappers, on the other hand, are operating purely uh, via illegal means and snatching people off the streets, sometimes in broad daylight, but oftentimes taking children and women 
um, from South Philadelphia along the docks. Um, what I find is that this distinction in the minds of black Americans and their white allies, this distinction between slave catchers and kidnappers, they're one and the same. They assume that all human beings were born free, that um, part of this freedom was fundamental dignity of the human person, as well as the fundamental uh, equality that everybody possessed or was said to have possessed. So in the, the minds of black abolitionists and their allies, um, a slave catcher was no different from a kidnapper. It was no different from a slaveholder. Um, they were sort of intertwined there. Now your book covers the period from 1820 to 1850. Why did you select those decades? Um, so initially, I started with 1820 because I wanted to get a better sense of the uh, cases and the, what instigated the 1820 uh, Pennsylvania Liberty Law, which these liberty laws that were later passed by other northern states are very similar to just states' rights documents, right? Another thing that uh, many Americans think today is when they think of states' rights, they think about the South, they think about the Confederacy. Well, it turns out in 1820, states like Pennsylvania begin passing these personal liberty laws or these liberty laws, which are designed to protect black citizens from um, retrieval or kidnapping. Um, so I chose 1820 because I want to know the cases. Uh, historians have looked at the legislative debates, but it's typically looking at the elite. I wanted to see the cases that instigated um, the passage of the 1820 law. Uh, I end it in 1850 with the passage of the, uh, the Revised and Strengthened Fugitive Slave Act, because I kind of see this linear um, set of moments that lead from Pennsylvania taking a stand in 1820, um, finally to the federal government um, bolstering slave catchers, slaveholders, um, right to property across the nation. So I, I ended it in 1850 for that reason. So let's go back and look at a bit, a little bit of the legal context. Uh, in 1780, Pennsylvania passes the Grab Gradual Abolition Act. What, what were the provisions in that, and what did that mean for Pennsylvania at the start of your book in 1820? Right. So with gradual ab abolition, right, this is a really a dual effort, both by Black Americans, but in particular um, Quakers. Um, it allowed for, um, it basically, it abolished slavery after 18, eight, or 1780 in the state. Now, the issue was that um, people, slaveholders from the South, would bring enslaved people with them into Pennsylvania. They were, under these provisions of Pennsylvania state law, they were required to register within six months um, enslaved people that they brought with them, or else they would be considered free. Um, and so what you have is this, this transitional moment. It's almost like what one, one historian of the time has called it sort of the North's Reconstruction. So the, um, the battles that were fought in the Reconstruction era after the Civil War, it's almost as if these similar Reconstruction battles are being fought prior to and during the American Revolutionary War, or, or immediately after the Revolutionary War. Um, so freedom was certainly precarious for black Americans, many of whom um, by the by, 1800, 1810, uh, living you know 30 years after that uh, gradual abolition act, um, they were free and they had been born free and their parents were free. Um, the, the, the issue the, that became evident though um, in the early part of the 19th century was that slave catchers and slaveholders assumed that when they saw a black American that they were at some time enslaved. Right, and that's where their sort of plausible deniability kicks in and says, "Well, I thought this was an enslaved person who ran away from me." So it was, it was much more contested um, after 1780 and up through 1820 um, than many of us recognize. What was the relationship between the the expansion of slavery into the Deep South and into the West and the rise of kidnapping in the Northern states? Yeah, that's that's a really interesting link. So. What you have, and this is sort of a good example of street diplomacy, where you'll have these cases. Uh, for example, there's two, two cases I name off the top of my head. One, Abraham Comedy, who was uh, a boy that was kidnapped uh, by two white men. Um, the white men hired him to take wood uh, to somewhere in Delaware, so, and it turns out they actually sell him to a kidnapping gang. Um, when Kwamini is finally freed, uh, not only did Kwamini, through his you know, black and white allies, harness the power of local officials, but they also harnessed the power of state officials and federal officials. And so many of the Pennsylvania Abolitionist Society's um, allies uh, served in Congress, served in the Senate, and would draw these, dis draw these links between the spread of slavery to the 
deep south, what is now we call the deep south, um, via the Missouri Compromise into the west, um, and link it to um, conditions in their home state and conditions in Philadelphia in which um, black Philadelphia became a lure for kidnappers who thought they could make some easy money kidnapping especially black children um, and selling them to the Deep South. And what I found typically is when these kidnappers brought or, or when they stole uh, black Americans from Philadelphia, once, um, once these black Americans were taken really below Virginia, it was very difficult for them to be found, retrieved, or liberated um, just because of the nature of the cotton economy and the spread west. Now, in the book, you talk about how, as slavery was expanding into the Deep South and the West, that, that there was an internal slave trade expanding during this period. And you quote Ira Berlin as calling it the Second Middle Passage. How extensive was it? Well, the Second Middle Passage, I believe the numbers are something like two million people were um, forced, uh, two, million, two million enslaved people were forced from the Upper South, which was places like Virginia, Maryland, to the Deep South. And this Second Middle Passage, um, you see Philadelphia and Pennsylvania in particular being on the border, quote unquote, of that um, Second Middle Passage. And as a result, um, black Americans living along this supposed border to freedom uh, were more susceptible to kidnapping and then once stolen from the state, um, sent down to places as far as Alabama or Texas. Now, you mentioned a kidnapping gang. Are you talking about the Cannon Johnson kidnapping gang that was in, in Delaware? Yeah. Yeah. So the Cannon Johnson uh, kidnapping gang has had sort of like a, a strange, like a historiographical renaissance in the last decade and a half. Um, the work of Richard Bell has been particularly instructive on that score, as well as Andrew Diemer. He's, he's talked about them a bit. Um, this was a gang that was notorious by 1820. They were notorious for a number of things. Um, not just kidnapping, but just brutal violence, murder. Um, and what I think made them so deadly um, and really on the radars of blacks and whites in Philadelphia, black and white allies in Philadelphia, was that these gangs were uh, multiracial, interracial in scope, uh, would often send black decoys into the city to find susceptible black Philadelphians um, and bring them back. And so that was another major day, another dangerous reality that black Americans had to face, even within their own community. Um, not just these, you know, kidnappers who are, you know, white or, you know, slave catchers who are white or slaveholders who are white. You know, you, you might run into these issues. And one of the cases, actually one of the cases that inspired the 1820 Liberty Law was the case of a man named William Young, who was a mixed race man who, um, in the language of the time, seduced three other black men to help him load wood, and then they disappear, and William Young comes back into town, and he's dressed to the nines. He, and he's basically, you know, in some ways, converted these human beings not only into cash, but into his clothing. And, you know, white and black abolition societies were very much aware of this. Um, the judge in William Young's case, besides, you know, making this play, plea to revise um, legislation relating to kidnapping laws in Philadelphia, he remarks quite um, significantly on the fact that William Young was black doing this to other black people. So the Cannon Johnson gang was dangerous on multiple levels. They weren't afraid to use the violence. They weren't afraid to hold guns to abolitionists' head as they would search the house. Um, and they almost flaunted it in the Delmarva Peninsula, and that would include murder, if need be. So given everything that you're talking about, what would life have been like just on a daily level for African Americans in Philadelphia? Uh, you do tell the story about one man who was simply praying in his home. Uh, you tell that story and just kind of connect it to this, the larger life experience that, they, that people would have had. Sure, yeah. So that, that case, um, it's the case of a man named Perry Frisbee, who one late afternoon in the summer of 1819, he's praying at his bedside. And he hears a knock at the door, and when he goes to open the door, turns out it's this professional slave catcher, George Alberti, who greets him with a punch to the face, drags Perry Frisbee down the streets of uh, South Philadelphia, brings him to some, you know, obviously corrupt aldermen, gets this certificate of removal, which, which says that Perry Frisbee is not a free man, he's actually a runaway. Um, and Alberti brings him down to, I believe, Maryland, and eventually through the, the workings of both um, Perry Frisbee's um, family and his friends, white and black, he's eventually returned to Philadelphia. 
Um, so in that way, it really does collapse. You know, that's collapsing space. But I think what I think what, what I think is kind of interesting too is looking at Perry Frisbee's case. One of the major people that influenced um, this entire project was this 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 George Alberti character. Um, and what I found very early on, which I'm, I, it was kind of a strange link to find, was that Alberti's, you know, uncle-in-law through marriage was Thomas Shipley. And Thomas Shipley, we probably, nobody probably knows who he is today. I hope, you know, after reading the book, they'll know who he is. Uh, but Thomas Shipley was a prestigious and a hardworking um, white abolitionist who, at the time of his death, um, was an officer in the Pennsylvania Abolition Society. So within one family, right, you've got completely opposite end of the spectrum in terms of understanding what freedom meant, what enslavement meant. Um, and so I think cases like Perry, uh, Perry Frisbee really bring together these different forces. So we talked about George Alberti. He was a constable. Can you talk about what a constable was and what the relationship with say, uh, the kind of role in, uh, in this effort to retrieve slaves? Yeah, so what you find over and over again is that in the cases uh, outlined by the Pennsylvania Abolition Society, particularly the acting committee, which was a group of really the younger, the junior officers of the Pennsylvania Abolition Society, um, what you find in their records is that more often than not, slaveholders would need to recruit constables. Um, and this really stems from the fact that the 1793 Fugitive Slave Law that was passed by uh, Congress um, during Washington's administration, the federal government really was lacking in personnel. So the question of how this law would be enforced fell to slaveholders, as well as people like a George Alberti, who would literally be recruited and you know, as I found with some more digging, they would bring they would bring to the attention slaveholders, people who they believed were runaways. So the relationship between the constables and the black community in general was um, contentious to say the least. Um, black Philadelphian sailmaker, wealthy black elite member uh, James Fortin writes about this as early as 1813 that the constables made a sport out of hunting black Americans and just say little things, you know, walking down the street, constable sees a black man, he might say, hey, where's your certificate? And what that would do, would it would encourage um, typically younger white Philadelphians to chase the man down and try to bring them before some alderman or justice of the peace to get them to be removed. So it was a very contentious uh, relationship. But I must say, too, that there were good constables. Um, there were um, P there were constables who were connected to the Pennsylvania Abolition Society, one of whom um, actually went all the way down to Mississippi to try to help uh, save black ki children who were uh, kidnapped by the Cannon Johnsons. Uh, now, you also mentioned aldermans. Uh, wh what were aldermans and what was their role in once somebody was captured and they were taken to an alderman, what was the alderman doing? The alderman was basically get getting proof from whoever uh, was, you know, who, whoever captured these black Americans getting proof that they were, in fact, uh, fugitives from slavery. And sometimes what these constables or the slaveholders would do who were acting, who were there, uh, they would, you know, bring physical descriptions, they would bring wills, they would bring um, advertisements, right, runaway advertisements. And the alderman just really just had to make a gut decision. Now, what you find over and over again is that these aldermen were pretty corrupt themselves and that they would get kickbacks from the constables, get kickbacks from the slaveholders. So one of the um, provisions of the 1820 Pennsylvania Liberty Law was actually to limit and deny uh, what they called petty officials uh, like aldermen, like justices of the peace, from weighing in on these removal incidents because they just couldn't be trusted at the local level. Now, there are several liberty laws that were passed during the period that you cover in the book. Uh, another one was in 1826. What was it that brought that about? Sure. So after 1820 in Pennsylvania, um, there's still this phenomenon of enslaved people from Maryland and Virginia freeing themselves, right? This is something that happens throughout the 19th century. And where do the majority of these black Americans go? They go to Philadelphia for multiple reasons. One, it's the most robust, most strident, most well-organized uh, black community in the North uh, during this time. Um, they can blend in. They can find work. Um, so 
Maryland slaveholders, um, some of them who were politically connected, served as you know members of the Maryland state legislature. They grew so annoyed by this phenomenon, especially when their supposed property, uh, excuse me, escaped and ran to Philadelphia, uh, ran to places like Philadelphia, that they pressured the Pennsylvania state legislature to revise their kidnapping laws um, in the sense of allowing more state officials to weigh in on removal incidents. Um, however, you know, this is where street diplomats really spring into action. Both black and white abolitionists flood Harrisburg, not only with petitions, but their physical presence. So people like Stephen Gloucester uh, and Richard Allen, two prominent members of the black community, went to Harrisburg and cornered lawmakers and told them what was happening, writing letters. And some of these letters, like you, if you look at them, you can swear that you can see like tears coming down the pages. Um, so people like Richard Allen are pressuring lawmakers face to face. And so the combined efforts of black and white abolitionists that I'm calling street diplomats, although more state officials in 1826 were now permitted to weigh in on these removals, um, what the Quakers and the black abolitionists were able to win in this, um, this legislation was the fact that slaveholder testimony would not be accepted as proof. Uh, instead, slaveholders would have to get a signed affidavit. So it became more of a, legally, a legalistic way of making the retrieval process such a pain for slaveholders that they would not want to go into Pennsylvania to try to retrieve people. But on the other hand, right, there's always going to be sort of this like kickback, a knock-on effect that all that did was encourage kidnappings because now slaveholders are like, well, if I'm not going to go through Pennsylvania state law, I might just try to get a kidnapper to do it for me. They say that uh, by 1820, two political coalitions uh, fir were firmly rooted in the state, the old school Democrats and the new school Democrats. What was the difference between the two? What, what the difference is between uh, the old school and the new school was really it came down on things like the hard money, soft money question, right? That um, the, the old school preferred the, um, they, they preferred hard currency, so gold, silver, things like that, whereas the new school preferred sort of the soft money, which is, you know, what we call just paper money. Um, both sides, and I, the, the old school especially, were politically connected amongst these Philadelphia dynasties, um, which are these familial dynasties that, you know, a whole book could be written about this, but some of these families had ties directly to the South. Right. So it was in their interest, both as politicians to maintain the union, but also as their family members complaining about Pennsylvania being this bastion of liberty, um, that those are the two parties that sort of arose by 1820. And your book, you use a variety of case studies uh, throughout the book. One of them was uh, of an African-American woman named Ann Chambers. Who was, who was she? Right. So Ann Chambers was a young woman who on the uh, one morning, this is, I believe, in 1822, she goes to her place of work. And as she's walking in the door, she's apprehended um, by two slave catchers and a constable, a Philadelphia constable. And so Ann Chambers just rushed out to um, the house of Judge Richard Peters, who was a federal judge. So even here, you can kind of see how slave catchers and constables are trying to use federal law as opposed to Pennsylvania state law. So they take and Chambers to um, to Judge Richard Peter's house, which is actually in, um, it's on the Belmont Plateau. It's it's Belmont Mansion, still standing today. Um, Ann Chambers gets there, but at the same time, Ann Chambers' friends have been alerted to her kidnapping, and they send, um, you know, not only black witnesses, but white abolitionists. And Ann Chambers makes the case and gives her, quote unquote, solemn assurance that she is indeed a, freed, a free woman. Um, and Peters believes her, yet he does a strange thing. He puts Ann Chambers in the carriage of the, um, the slave catchers and the constables who actually brought her to him, uh, to Peters, and they bring her back to Philadelphia. And as they're bringing her back, they start debating again whether or not they should just, you know, don't, let's not go back to Arch Street, let's just bring her down to the South. Uh, and finally, they decide, you know what, too risky, so they tell her to, you know, wipe her tears, dry her face, don't let any of those damned Quakers know what's happening, and they throw her out onto the street. Um, so little cases, cases like that that really um, capture the essence of the, this distinction, between, there's sort of more of this illusory distinction between slave catching and kidnapping. These are, the, these are the cases that I think, you know, change people's lives, to say the least. They change people's lives, but they also brought about a, a, a stronger sense of community between white and black abolitionists. So if, if, 
somebody was being pulled off the street by a kidnapper or a slave catcher, would people intervene? Would bystanders intervene? It all depended. Um, you know, there are plenty of cases in which, um, you know, black Americans were seized on the streets of Philadelphia and dragged bloody healed to the old state house. And the old state house is what we call Independence Hall. So Independence Hall uh, was the site of dozens of fugitive slave cases. So sometimes this would happen, right, where if the person made enough of a commotion or just happened to have a sympathetic white or black Philadelphia in the vicinity, then this is when sort of street diplomacy would kick into gear and these people would be saved. So it, it, could, be a t it could be a toss up, but the, the fact remained that um, these sort of uh, you know, seizures would happen um, and it was up to both sides, both the street diplomats as well and their opponents to ultimately contest the, the person who's been seized, their freedom or their enslavement. Now, another part of the history that, that you cover in your book are, are a, a series of riots. Uh, what was this role of rioting uh, in this process that you're talking about? Right. So you see this um, explosion of riots across the United States during the 1830s, um, and Philadelphia would be no exception. What, what's interesting about Philadelphia, there's been studies done on rioting in the, in the United States at this time. And, you know, most people, most historians would focus, you know, on property damage, uh, in one section of the country versus, you know, physical assault and others. And what you see in Philadelphia is happening, it, both are happening at the same time. Uh, Philadelphia becomes a bastion for immediatism, right? So this is the new wave of abolitionists in the 1830s who are sick of this sort of gradualist approach, right? Gradual emancipation. They want immediate, uncompensated abolition. Um, because Philadelphia hosts the strongest black community in the United States at the time, um, abolitionists of the immediatist stripe flock to Philadelphia. They hold meetings um, and they agitate. I mean, they're, they're led by people like Frederick Douglass, led by people like Garrison and Robert Purvis, who is a mixed race Philadelphian. Um, so in the 1834, 1835 time frame, you see these riots erupting, but you also get the sense that some white Philadelphians would use any pretense to attack black Philadelphians. Um, and so in the 1834 riot, it starts at a uh, this sort of inter interracial meeting spot uh, called the Flying Horses Carousel. Um, the outbreak of that riot leads to three days of the pillaging of black Philadelphia. In 1835, um, a, a man who was brought back from Cuba um, and never actually formally emancipated, even though it was technically illegal for him to be brought back, this man, only known as Juan in the records, um, he attacks his master, you know, quote unquote master, um, this man named Robert Student, uh, Stewart, who was the consul to uh, Cuba. So this unleashes another major set of riots in Philadelphia, although it is interesting that in the wake of these riots, there is a, um, there's a pretty interesting case involving a woman named Mary Gilmore, who was adopted by this wealthy family, uh, the patriarch of whom was um, Jacob Gilmore. But Mary Gilmore, by all appearances, is phenotypically white. And so this becomes this really curious case of, wait a minute, is she going to be sent to slavery? She looks white. And Jacob Gilmore swears that she is her, his adopted daughter. Well, when the case is going on, the, the black witnesses who were attesting to uh, Mary Gilmore's uh, enslavement, they're actually attacked by Mary Gilmore's friends. And when news is received in places like Wilmington, Delaware, of this case, when um, Mary Gilmore's accusers arrive in Wilmington, they're actually beat there, too. So th these riots just, uh, they erupt. Um, and whenever these grand juries in Philadelphia meet and try to decide what was the cause, they sometimes they'll, they'll say things like, oh, you know, it's job competition between whites and blacks. But lurking within all the justifications for the riot um, is the fact that if it weren't for those abolitionists who are agitating over freedom, if it weren't for the black community trying to save or rescue those who are going to be kidnapped, then these riots wouldn't have, have occurred. And so black Philadelphians usually would bear the, the burden of um, the wrath of what happens to them during these riots. We'll be back in a moment with the PA Books podcast. Enjoying this podcast? Please support PCN with a donation at PCNTV.com. <laughs> 
This link and others can be found in our show notes. We appreciate your support. They say in the book that uh, many whites did not take kindly to, to displays of black achievement and community strength, and that that was often a spur for, for white people to riot against, against African Americans, and that black cultural institutions were also targeted precisely because they were beacons of hope and safe havens for the black community. Right. So, yeah, that's uh, in reference to um, the, the 1842 Lombard Street riots, uh, which is a really it's a very exciting uh, moment in Philadelphia history that um, we, we kind of overlook. So throughout the 1820s, um, African Amer black Americans begin to form what are called vigilance or protecting societies. And they actually advertise uh, in Philadelphia newspapers saying, look, like, we know that there's a set of, quote unquote, unprincipled men, a.k.a. Sl slave catchers, kidnappers, who are in Philadelphia. If you need help or want to help us, um, join these protecting c committees or join these vigilance committees. And so in 1842, the Young Men's Vigilance Committee of Philadelphia, which was black-led, black-run, 1,000 of its members parade down um, South Street in, obviously, South Philadelphia to celebrate the emancipation of the British West Indies. Um, and this show of force completely just blew the minds of white Philadelphians. And a riot erupted soon thereafter when uh, a white boy was punched by one of the marchers. Um, and this lead, leads to um, the burning of a significant portion of black Philadelphia. Um, and I want to note, too, that during all of these anti-black uh, riots, um, thousands of African thousands of African Americans left the city and would have to sort of camp out in the surrounding farmlands because they were fearful of their lives, uh, fear for their lives. And people like Robert Purvis, who was, you know, this leader of the Vigilance Committee during the course of the 1842 riots, he had to arm himself and sit at the base of his stairs in his house and just waiting for the rioters to burst in and do God knows what to him. Um, so, yeah, this, this show of force and black achievement really was viewed as a threat um, to whites in Philadelphia. Another incident that you mentioned took place in 1825. You say a group of young white men burst into Mother Bethel AME Church, demanded the right to smoke cigars during the service. What happened? Right. So this is the case where, um, you know, almost like a melee breaks out. Um, Mother Bethel had always been targeted. Um, things like, you know, people would throw pepper down the chimney and, you know, black Americans would have to rush out. And so, yeah, I mean, this is this is sort of the war zone that would erupt uh, in right in the sp public spaces in front of these institutions. And um, these are sort of raising the alarm bells of white abolitionists. And if anything, it redoubles the efforts of uh, black and white abolitionists towards fending off threats to black freedom. Now, another case study you, you talk about is uh, the case of John Reed. Who is he? So John Reed uh, had freed himself from Maryland slave owners shortly after, or I'm sorry, during the during the debates of um, over the Liberty Law, uh, the 1820 Liberty Law, and so he's living in Westchester. And one night, um, his former uh, his former owner and his overseer come to take him, and John Reed screams at the top of his lungs, "It's life for life!" And he kills both of them. And so John Reed's taken to trial twice. In the first trial, he is he's let off because it's clear that he was trying to be kidnapped, right? So this is like the plausible deniability angle. But at the second trial, the judge says, no, wait a minute, if you're defending yourself, you're probably a fugitive from slavery, therefore you're guilty. And so he gets sentenced uh, for the murders of those two men. Now, uh, during this time period, uh, Andrew Jackson is elected as president. How does his election and what would become called the democracy, how does that affect politics in Pennsylvania? Right. So Pennsylvania was actually one of the first um, states to really champion Jackson. And uh, what you find um, in places like Philadelphia is that these ties to Jackson are are strengthened, um, especially by the arrival of waves of Irish immigrants, many of whom end up voting Democratic, many of whom also live side by side with black Americans. So um, having the slaveholder in office, having this notorious slaveholder in office, um, certainly strengthened the, uh, the democracy, democracy's grip um, on Philadelphia. And so what you see happening in Philadelphia prior to the 1850s is that there is a core of um, the sort of the commercial core of Philadelphia, which is sort of, you know, center city, I guess we can consider it today, 
um, was primarily uh, friendly to the Whig Party. And many of these um, Whig Party members were affiliated with uh, the Pennsylvania Abolitionist Society. I remember reading in one of the, uh, the journals of a, I believe it was Dilwyn Parish's journal, uh, the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, how he complains about the, the Mobocrats, the Jacksonians, uh, are trying to influence elections at the local level. Whereas, so if the Whigs are in the center of the city, the quote unquote outskirts of the city, places like Moya Mensing, South Park, um, these, these sort of the Philadelphia County, those are really controlled by the Democratic political machine. And the, the local uh, constabulary, people like George Alberti, all have ties to these, uh, these Democrats. So uh, I want to continue on in that a little bit. You also talk about the second party system and its influence in Philadelphia. What, what was the second party system? So the second party system arose um, really in response to the election of Andrew Jackson. Um, so the Whig Party is, is part of that. So the, Demo the democracy or the Democratic Party um, preferred in large part to focus on the agrarian interests, the agrarian future of the country, primarily with a, a basic um, their basic constituency came from poor whites across the country, whereas the Whigs, people like Henry Clay, were more into internal improvements and sort of breaking down the, the borders between, uh, between the sections. Now, we can't kid ourselves, both, you know, even though the second party system had um, support in both sections of the country, that also means that there were Whig slave owners, right? There were Whig, Whig abolitionists. Um, and so what you see happening in Philadelphia is these abolitionists tend to, to support the Whig Party, um, although during the course of the book you find that some abolitionists, white abolitionists in particular, um, sort of think that the Whigs are somewhat of sellouts, they, that they can't protect their interests, that they're not sticking up for the state, that they're not sticking up for freedom. How did the influx of Irish immigrants uh, affect the, some of these issues that we're talking about? Right. So. Very early on, with the, the waves of Irish immigrants coming in the 1830s, 1840s, um, not only are they going to be supported by the Democratic Party, um, they're also going to start forming fire companies, and then take, then they, you know, sort of ble that bleeds into the police department. So, the, the firefighters during this era are, in, in the word of words of one historian, more than more, it's basically organized gangs, just gangs. Um, of people who come together, yes, to put out fires, but also they like to fight, and they like to fight not only rival fire companies, but they like to um, take out their aggression on the black community. So many of the rioters uh, throughout the 1830s um, were primarily Irish, primarily working class Irish, many of whom had ties to these fire companies who then therefore had ties to the democratic political machine in Philadelphia. Now, you say that uh, by 1836, Philadelphia was a city in transition. What, what was going on? Right. So by the late 1830s, what you see happening is um, Philadelphia is sort of go getting at the cusp of becoming more of like an industrialized city, uh, not industrialized as we probably understand it from the later 19th century, but this combination of, a, um, of the, the new immigrant population um, coupled with the pre-existing um, the pre-existing notoriety and strength of the black community um, at this time. This is what sort of brings together these these different um, these different or brings about these different conflicts between these groups. So this transition also um, what we're looking at really is the ways in which black and white abolitionists more and more start to investigate more clandestine means of um, protecting black Americans, saving them from kidnappers, and ultimately laying the uh, groundwork for the Underground Railroad. Now, also in the late 1830s, uh, Pennsylvania held a constitutional convention. Uh, what effect did that have on uh, black voting rights? Right, so this is a, th that's a really good question, and it's, uh, it's sort of a contentious one when it comes down to the raw numbers that some historians argue that, Afri that black Americans were voting prior to uh, 1838, but um, what we find happening is when Pennsylvania revises its state constitution, it, it disenfranchises black Americans, right? So if they had this right, uh, it was taken away from them. And so there were a, a couple of instances outside of Philadelphia in which uh, blacks went to vote, their votes were overturned, 
Um, and so when these constitutional, the state constitutional conventions um, meet in Philadelphia in 1838, um, you have a, typically Whig politicians sticking up for black Americans, uh, but Democratic politicians in Philadelphia and in the surrounding counties of Philadelphia um, saying the most racist things you can think imaginable regarding the black population as rationale for why they should not have the right to vote. Um, the, the fears that they have are uh, multi, multi-sided, but one of the interesting fears that these, um, these white Democrats had was that if blacks could vote, they might start voting themselves into office and then everything's lost. How could that be a thing? You know, how could that be possible? What's happening to our, you know, our white democracy? Um, during these conventions that are held in Philadelphia, though, uh, white and black and abolitionists, they attend. And actually, in one instance, a number of black abolitionists are, are thrown out of the gallery because they're cursing and threatening these uh, Democratic politicians who are trying to strip them of um, their rights. Now, you mentioned some court cases. Uh, one of those was Fogg versus Hobbs. Who was William Fogg? So uh, Fogg versus so this is the case where um, they there were voting illegally or seemed to be vo voting illegally, and as a result of this case, uh, this sort of adds um, ammunition to white Democrats' uh, rationale to disenfranchise. Now, during some of this uh, period that you're talking about, there was the Nat Turner Rebellion. Uh, who was Nat Turner? What impact did that have on Pennsylvania? Right. So this is something that's sort of overlooked. Um, so Nat Turner. Um, and a, a group of enslaved people in Virginia uh, start a rebellion in which they go from plantation to plantation um, killing whites, right? And so what this does in the South is it really sets off all the alarm bells that, um, you know, any sort of hint of uh, gradual emancipation efforts or any sort of hint at relaxing um, laws relating to enslavement were sort of out the window at this point. And so what it launches down South is this um, fierce retribution on the black communities of Virginia in particular. Um, however, in Philadelphia, this is something that's relatively unexplored, but in Philadelphia, Nat Turner, um, uh, there were rumors that survivors or some of his followers were going to come into Philadelphia and also wreak havoc uh, there. So a, a, once again, the, the white political machine, specifically the Democrats, hold these meetings, and they're well attended, thousands of people um, in attendance hold these meetings where basically they say, look, if, if need be, there's no reason why Philadelphians, why Pennsylvanians, why Northerners can't stand shoulder to shoulder with uh, white Southerners in putting down slave rebellions. Now, another case study that, that you mentioned in the book is that of Ezekiel Freeman. Who is he? So Ezekiel Freeman uh, was an African-American man in Philadelphia who was um, taken, uh, seized on the streets of Philadelphia, and he drew such a large crowd when these, these slave catchers brought him to um, an alderman's office that um, it allowed him to escape because the slave catchers were distracted. And so what uh, Ezekiel Freeman does is he runs into um, a watch shop owned by a man named Samuel Mason, Jr., so Samuel Mason Jr. is a white abolitionist who was obviously in the Pennsylvania Abolition Society. And when uh, Samuel Mason locks the door, Ezekiel Freeman becomes a free man. He escapes out the back. But uh, Samuel Mason's taken to court um, because he locked the door. And so what you see happening in um, a, a case like Ezekiel Freeman is um, White Philadelphians, uh, the, the allies of um, black abolitionists in the black community, they had mere moments to decide whether or not to help somebody. And in this case, Samuel Mason, uh, as an abolitionist, really didn't hesitate. Um, and so Mason is eventually freed. But it just shows you how these, um, these events, these struggles could, could just explode at any moment. So as, as African Americans were, were moving into Pennsylvania during this period, uh, were there legal efforts to try to restrict or stop uh, black migration into Pennsylvania? Right. So that, that's sort of one of the, uh, the consequences of uh, Nat Turner's rebellion. And it was something that had been broached in the Pennsylvania state legislature in the decades prior to Turner, but it was certainly um, broached in a much heavier, heavy-handed way in, uh, after Nat Turner. So there were many efforts uh, by Democrats in the Pennsylvania state legislature uh, 
to restrict or deny any black immigration into the state. Uh, there were measures put forward that, um, that argued that blacks should have to register when they move from county to county, that basically their mobility would be tracked no matter where they went. And a lot of the evidence that um, these Democrats used was based on inflated numbers of the black population of Pennsylvania, but not until um, some Pennsylvania abolitionist allies in the state legislature uh, corrected them on these numbers, saying that, no, this is not some major wave. Um, so yeah, there were, there were efforts to prevent black immigration into the state, as well as the constant surveillance of blacks already in the state. How did the outbreak of war uh, with Mexico in 1846 affect some of the political debates going on in Pennsylvania? Right. That, so this is what would essentially leads to the 1847 Pennsylvania Liberty Law. Um, just to sort of like you know keep track of what we're talking about here. So after the 1826 law, uh, Liberty Law in Pennsylvania, um, within the decade and a half, um, it is struck down by the Supreme Court. Um, with the, the Justice uh, Joseph Story writing in Prig v. Pennsylvania that federal law allows for almost unre basically unrestricted access for slaveholders to retrieve black Americans anywhere across the Union. However, he says that state officials would have to abide by that unless they were prohibited by state legislation. So that leaves open the question of whether or not state officials in Pennsylvania have to actually aid in federal retrieval efforts. Um, so by 1846, with the outbreak of war in Mexico, another Pennsylvanian, this, this time David Wilmot, a Democrat from the northwestern portion of the state, um, he introduces into Congress something called that's now called the Wilmot Proviso, basically saying that um, any land that's won in the war against Mexico should be free from slave labor, right? And obviously the flip side to this is it should only be open to white labor. So David Wilmot's proviso uh, in 1846 uh, drives a wedge between not necessarily the political parties, but um, the sections that these parties affiliated with. So on voting for the proviso, you find Northern Democrats and Northern Whigs teaming up against Southern Democrats and Southern Whigs. So this is a somewhat of an unprecedented moment in the second party system in which parties are not a party of allegiances are being sort of overturned by sectional allegiances. So the war in Mexico um, brings about a change in the Pennsylvania state legislature because many um, Pennsylvanians were convinced that this was a war for slavery uh, that didn't represent the union's best interests, that um, if the war for Mexico was successful, then more slave states would be created, which would weaken northern representation in Congress. Um, so by 1846, the Pennsylvania state legislature flips and becomes Whig dominated. And part of this Whig domination in the Pennsylvania state legislature includes um, two abolitionist friendly, or specifically Pennsylvania Abolitionist Society friendly um, speakers, one of the, sp the speaker in the state Senate and the state house. And so due to the outbreak of war in Mexico, um, this sort of galvanizes support for, um, for the idea of strengthening the uh, the ability of Pennsylvania to protect its black residents and results in the 1847 uh, Pennsylvania Liberty Law. How does the free soil doctrine fit into all this? Right. So this is this is it's a, it's a great question because it's, it's, it's complicated, right? That uh, the assumption is um, by many who study the time period in the past that um, the Pennsylvania was free soil, right? And it's I think it's it's more realistic to look at it in terms of black Americans define their own free soil, right? That black Americans are using the same language that the founders used to define their freedom and clamoring for rights that they believed they were guaranteed um, under the Constitution and even, you know, in a deeper level, what the Declaration of Independence uh, has, you know, had enshrined. So in many ways, black uh, Americans and their white allies uh, began defining free soil as um, Pennsylvania in the sense that Pennsylvania should be able to protect itself. Pennsylvania state's rights demand it. It's our duty to protect black freedom in this state. Uh, one of the incidences that happens in Philadelphia is the destruction of a place called Pennsylvania Hall. Uh, what was that structure and, and why was it destroyed? Right, so the Pennsylvania Hall, uh, which is, uh, gosh, only about less than a mile from here, 
Uh, Pennsylvania Hall was d designed to be, um, in the words of one contemporary, a temple of liberty, right? So this was a pretty imposing structure uh, that took thousands, subscribers paid, you know, thousands of dollars to support it. And what it was going to be was a really a meeting spot for uh, reform groups from across the United States. So not just abolitionists, but obviously women's rights activists. Um, and people who, in general, right, supported freedom and uh, were against the constant spread of slavery. So Pennsylvania Halls opened in 1838, and upon its opening, the immediate reaction of Pennsylvania Democrats, um, specifically Philadelphia Democrats, like the Ingersoll family, who served um, on the side of slave owners constantly when these cases erupt, the Ingersolls and the Democratic political machine of Philadelphia basically post placards around the city with the help of Southerners saying that the, the next thing that's going to happen at this hall is going to be race mixing. We can't have that. You know, the, basically the only thing that can solve this issue is if the if this Temple of Liberty is destroyed. So within three days of the opening of Pennsylvania Hall, uh, rioters uh, set fire to it and destroy it and it's rubble. Um, so yeah, this, this is just another one of those instances where Philadelphia is this, it, it attempts to be this bastion of liberty, and the expectation that it will be this bastion is premised upon, um, you know, the Declaration of Independence, uh, the Constitutional Convention, right, these, these major uh, moments in American history. And yet when abolitionists come together to uh, create a temple to promote that liberty, it's immediately destroyed. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about the abolition movement. Uh, what was the difference between radical abolitionists and maybe conservative abolitionists? Yeah, so um, this the the wave of abolitionists that we're probably most familiar with are the radicals, and these are the William Lloyd Garrisons and Frederick Douglasses, right? Radical to people living the time, certainly not radical to us today. Uh, the conservative wings of the abolitionist movement, um, this was what sort of the Pennsylvania Abolitionist Society has been portrayed as um, both in um, in the historiography on abolition, right? That the, the Pennsylvania Abolition Society was con conservative in the sense that it would promote things like petitioning efforts, talking to influential uh, white politicians, and not necessarily trying to you know destroy the Constitution or destroy the Union, right? So they were. A, this is like the old school abolitionists who were more focused on gradual efforts for emancipation versus the so-called radical movement, uh, radical wing of the abolitionists who not only um, wanted immediate emancipation, they wanted uncompensated emancipation. Um, they didn't, didn't want to have anything to do with the South. Um, and so that, those are sort of the major differences between the two groups. Although what I found is that um, when you look at the junior members of a so-called conservative organization like the Pennsylvania Abolition Society, uh, when you look at their acting committee, which is made up of young men, I mean, these are these are men who sort of cut their teeth in the 1820s and the 1830s, and they become, they are both, I think, by nature, more radical for the time period um, because of their willingness to work within the black community, to embed themselves, to make friends with these people. I mean, Thomas Shipley, when he died, all the black Philadelphia came out for him um, as his funeral procession went down the street, right? So, I mean, these were important figures um, who, whose radicalism, I think, has been underemphasized in the literature. Another part of the abolition movement that you mentioned is the convention movement. What was that? So, um, part of the convention movement, right, was not only just having these, you know, uh, these, these major meetings of uh, white abolitionists, but what we see happening is that Philadelphia hosts black con the black convention movement, and most of the black convention movements are um, dominated by black Philadelphia abolitionists, right? And so what these abolitionists do when they convene is um, not only do they have, you know, the officers, they have these debates and discussions, but they um, discuss, you know, how they can work with their white allies. They dis they write petitions to petition the state national legislatures. Um, and over time, we see other abolition societies arising that are through and through, um, through and through multiracial in scope. Um, and so I think that's one of the key um, the key bright spots, I think, from doing this research is seeing how white and black uh, abolitionists collaborated at, at different times, but also on different levels and very personal levels as well. Who was James Pennington and what were his chattel principles? <laughs> 
Right, so the chattel principle developed by um, a former enslaved man named James Pennington, the idea is that a person has a price, that the person can, um, and this is obviously, this is the negative, right? As a former slave, he's saying how the chattel principle is that a human being under slavery becomes a person with a price. Um, other studies of the American South have focused on how uh, the prices of enslaved people were sort of locked with the prices of cotton, right? As cotton went up, the cotton price went up, so did the, the price of the enslaved. And so one of the, um, you know, the, the, the dark underbelly of the book is, uh, one dark underbelly within the book is that um, this chattel principle functioned across the United States. This is not just a Southern phenomenon. This is not just uh, an enslaved person's phenomenon. This is the fact that, as I said earlier, um, when people were kidnapped, they were turned into money. And then they, that money was turned into commodities. Um, so this chattel principle was something that kind of defied borders and um, wreaked havoc on many black lives. We have just a couple of minutes left. But what would you like people to take away from your book? So what I want to take, one point, what I would like people to take away from the book is that um, the borders between slavery and freedom were much more precarious, uh, much more illusory than I think uh, we consider. We're often used to just putting the 19th century into two blocks, right? That there's the South and there's the North. There's the free states and the slave states. And when you analyze these battles of street diplomacy, you see that these, these conflicts at the local level had state and national ramifications. Um, so anybody reading the book, I would, I would hope would come out with the sense that um, the battles over freedom in the streets of Philadelphia um, became magnified, not only because of the links between events in Philadelphia events at the state level, events, events at the national level, but it is also um, a good way of understanding who we are as Americans and ultimately the ideals that we strive to achieve today. We've been talking about the book Street Diplomacy, The Politics of Slavery and Freedom in Philadelphia, 1820 to 1850. Elliot Drago, thank you for talking with me. Thank you. Listeners like you make PCN programming possible. Full episodes of PA Books as well as other PCN programs are available to stream with the PCN Select app. To learn more about PCN's mission and to support PCN with a donation, visit PCNTV.com. This link and others can be found in our show notes. We appreciate your support.